So, Netflix canceled another beloved show far before its prime and right when the world was beginning to take notice of its high quality. The official reason for its cancellation is, to paraphrase, the fact that despite the show's great critical and audience reception, that its audience wasn't wide enough to continue to be worth funding. Since Netflix is subscription-based, it's impossible to find exact numbers for how many people were buying or renewing the service based purely on a single show, but this only reinforces another argument, that a show doesn't necessarily need to be profitable to grant a benefit for its license holder. The idea of a prestige film dates back nearly a century, where studios would create a big-budget blockbuster not to generate revenue, but instead to generate goodwill. Studios would create a film or run a television show that wouldn't make them much money through advertising or ticket sales, but would increase the overall valuation of the company in the eyes of shareholders and audiences alike. This is something that's seen in cultural landmarks such as The Wizard of Oz, which, despite its popularity, barely managed a box office return until re-releases over a decade later. Or Star Trek, which didn't have great Nielsen ratings, but managed to find niche popularity with scientists, engineers, doctors, and other intellectuals. Not to mention the incredibly lucrative 18-35 to year old male demographic, something that advertisers had just recently made the connection with profitability to. And more recently, Arrested Development, a show that could never quite reach the viewership of its contemporaries, but still won enough awards and accolades to get floated along season after season. To look exclusively at economic data to gauge the quality of a show will only ever paint a partial picture. Because making money is something that every company is able to strive for, but generating a good public image is something that no amount of wealth is able to accomplish. And so I think that giving the recognition where it's due to quality programming is the type of thing that can only benefit the medium in the long run. Especially for a platform that's receiving an ample amount of negative press lately. Reinforcing that the platform itself is something worth dealing with account sharing regulations is vital towards keeping that goodwill alive. The purpose of this video is to examine how Inside Job was able to achieve its status as a quote, instant cold classic by looking at its attention to detail in world building, nuance in character development, and ability to resonate culturally with its humor. This video will be split into individual episode retrospectives, which themselves will be divided into four segments. Recap, for a brief summary of the episode's major plot beats. Rant, for something that relates to the show overall, if not the episode in particular. Review, where I share my personal opinions on the episode. And wrap up, anything I couldn't find another section for. Inside Job is a show that handles subject matter including substance abuse, childhood trauma, mental illness, talking bears, violence, and innuendo. I, like the show, don't stray away from bringing up these topics, and although I do sanitize my language where necessary for an easier viewing experience, listener discretion is still advised. Unprecedented Reagan, the tech head of Cognito Inc., picks up her father to stop him from scaring children outside the White House, and expresses her excitement at an imminent promotion to team leader, as well as her concerns that her father, a bitter ex-employee, might be rubbing off on her personality, making her antisocial and hard to get along with. These fears are vindicated when her awkwardness causes JR, the CEO, to hire a co-leader named Brett, a handsome yes-man whose charisma allows him to serve as a face for the group. But his general incompetence is put on display when Reagan is forced to take a hiatus after a meltdown, and the group's plan to replace the president with a more controllable robot results in Robotus trying to place America underneath a giant cube. In the end, Reagan is forced to work together with Brett to save the country, but more importantly to prove that she's not as disconnected and jaded as her father. First episodes of TV shows are primarily about introducing the setting and characters more so than they are about telling a plot, or at least, they introduce whatever the conceit of the show itself is meant to be. So it's fitting for Inside Job to spend more of its episode's runtime concerned with character reactions to the plot than the plot itself, with the world building existing largely to set the show apart from its contemporaries. Inside Job's world building is one of the strongest aspects of its writing, notably in the way that it uses real world conspiracy theories and rabbit hole topics to set up plot hooks in a way that viewers can immediately understand what's going on, only for the inevitable inversions of those theories to become the source of humor. Because the setting pulls so heavily from pop culture like this, little has to be done to explain why what's going on is going on, leading to a very efficient writing style that leaves much more room for character interactions and humor.
But this isn't to say that the show establishes everything in such a competent way. Many character introductions in this episode feel a bit shoehorned in, with everybody getting a short scene to state their name and quote, deal. And while starting the show with a new character being introduced into the dynamic helps to sell why this sort of thing would be necessary without taking the audience out of the experience, it still comes across as not trusting the audience enough to fill in the gaps on their own by letting character traits become apparent in a more natural way. That said, it's probably a better idea to gauge this episode's quality by how well it introduces the various aspects it needs to and how much of a balance is found, and in this way, Unprecedented succeeds at selling the appeal of the show well. There's enough room for referential humor, characterization, and comedy that builds off of the situations, something that is necessary as character-based comedy can't really be achieved while characters are still yet to be fully established. Clone Gunmen Having run out of money from the events of the previous episode, Reagan and Brett are forced to fire one member of Cognito in order to recoup the cost and put the company into the black again. After a bit of searching, she chooses grassy Noel Atkinson, who hasn't done much assassinating in a while anyway. But rather than announcing her decision, she instead revels in the popularity associated with everybody trying to brown nose their way to job security. This only lasts until she reveals her decision, at which time they all turn on her for firing an office hero. So, she releases a JFK clone for Atkinson to kill in order to make him an office hero and get her respect slash his job back. But the Kennedys become too sentient and go rogue, releasing the rest of the clones and eventually akira ing the office. Everybody has to work together to right the wrong, and eventually everything is restored back to normal, with the budget issue being resolved by the destruction of the clone labs. While this is occurring, JR is distracted by Rand Ridley releasing embarrassing secrets about him to the office, which he then uses as a tactic to lure JR into negotiations, where a sober Rand convinces him to give up more of his shares of Cognito Inc. With the setting and characters introduced during the previous episode, Clone Gunman is able to better tell a story that involves the personalities of the larger cast involved. In fact, the difference between this episode and the last one is large enough that I almost feel as though this episode could have been a better intro to the show in terms of how things are introduced. The sequence where the members of Cognito are trying to suck up to Reagan do a better job of introducing their personalities and roles in the world better than the introductions of the previous episodes due to fitting more easily into the show side of Show Don't Tell. That said, the plot does pick up right where the last episode left off, so it gets more of a pass in a way that a show that didn't serialize its plots like this would have. And this is ultimately why so many of the plots in this show work as well as they do. Because despite all of the world building and pop conspiracy references it makes, a majority of the plots in this show revolve around the flaws of its characters. The JF Kira only forms due to Reagan's desire to be liked, combined with Brett's affinity for Axe Body Spray. So the resolution of the plot where Reagan accepts passing Lori on to those who she viewed as inferior and unimportant rings so much better due to those flaws of hers being the thing that started the plot in the first place. If a story doesn't change much by swapping out the characters with any other group, then it's not a very compelling story, but in Inside Job many of the plots are prompted by petty aspirations and damaged egos. And so this is ultimately why a show like this is able to connect with its viewer base. Because none of the people watching can truly relate to running a global conspiracy corp, but we can relate to wanting to be liked by our co-workers. We might not have worked in a cloning lab, but we likely have sucked up to a person in a position of power for career-related aspirations. So long as the characters are grounded in reality and relatability, the setting and plots are free to go in practically any direction, and this is ultimately the strength of a show like Inside Job. Blue Bloods Hoping to mitigate a PR disaster involving the Reptoids, JR has his employees take sensitivity training, where it's revealed that Reagan cannot hug another person without lashing out violently. Rather than doing some soul-searching to learn why, she instead builds robotic arms to hug for her at a reptilian ball. This plan works for a time. Eventually, her arms malfunction and tear the arms of a diplomat off and so a hearing is held to resolve the dispute. There, it's revealed that Reagan had never been hugged as a child as Rand had created a robotic teddy bear to hug for him instead of showing affection. The reptilians ultimately decide not to press any serious charges and all ends in a status quo reinforcing orgy. Meanwhile, Brent deals with reuniting with some of his old college fraternity brothers and learns that, despite all the times they hazed him, he had never actually been accepted. 
When making referential humor in comedy, it's always difficult to find a balance between explaining the joke in such a way that somebody who doesn't get the reference can still enjoy the work, which runs the risk of over-explaining and ruining the punchline for people who got it right away. This, and making such a throwaway joke that doesn't rely at all on the thing being referenced, that you may as well have not referenced anything at all. Referential humor can work well, as the setup to the punchline you want to make is something that most viewers would be able to piece together on their own, while also making it seem as though you're saying something topical and relevant. But it comes with the great risk of dating your work. To include a pop culture reference is to announce the year that it was written in, or at least, the year the writers are stuck in, and then to eventually come across as awkward when whatever topic falls out of vogue. But it's not as though a dated show is inherently a bad one. It's perfectly fine for a show to be enjoyed in the moment, and then to serve as a time capsule for humor and culture of its era. But unfortunately, many of the references in this episode managed to slip on the balancing act I described earlier, and come across as, we said a celebrity name but with the lizard pun. And while a lot of the jokes land well, even getting a laugh out of me on a second and third viewing, the handful that don't end up making it appear as though the good jokes in this episode were just lucky breaks. But it's not as though a show like this has to exclusively focus on humor in order to show off its better qualities. We get a lot of insight into Reagan's childhood here, and this is a plot point that ends up becoming vitally important down the line. On top of that, Brett begins receiving more development as well as the audience gets to take a look into the psyche of a character who was initially introduced as someone whose personality was not having one. So while the episode stutters a bit in executing its ideas, ultimately it's saved by the strong character writing and ability to subtly set up future plots, both internal and external. Sex Machina To settle a bet on whether or not she'll die alone, Reagan puts herself on a dating app, but when that proves to be too much, she instead makes a robotic boyfriend to test run social interaction before moving straight into the real thing. But after realizing that real human connection is overrated anyway, she decides to simply date the robot, who, like Robotus, becomes too aware and creates his own robotic version of Reagan. Eventually, she's forced to confront the better version of herself, and ends up accepting that she's blown her chances, not that it stops her from continuing to search. In the B-plot, Brett and Glenn switch bodies in order to make some sort of moral about appearances that results in Brett sexually satisfying Glenn's ex-wife. The primary appeal of a show like Inside Job is always going to come more from the people in its setting and plot lines than the setting and the plot itself. The latter serves as a vehicle with which to better explore the characters we relate to just as much as those characters serve to let us explore the rest of the world. A story that involves the government tracking everybody's dating profiles is much less interesting than a story about somebody using those profiles to compile a curated list of matches for themselves. And then of course, this turns into a story about the logical conclusion of somebody trying to optimize interpersonal experiences. Why bother with all of the unpredictability of emotions when you can have a significant other who can be turned off at will? This episode gives us a deep look into the inner lives of characters like Brett, Glenn, and of course, Reagan, allowing us to see the world through their eyes by exploring idealized versions of the worlds can give us a much better glimpse into their psyche than looking at the reality of the situation. Rather than having a character explain their wants, we can give the character their wants and watch them fail to lead a better life, and in turn, we learn why they wanted what they did instead. Brett wants to be loved for who he is and not how he looks, and so to prove that he has value through his own ideals, he trades with Glenn. Glenn believes that his personality is fine and that it's his appearance that's holding back his relationships, only to learn that once people get to know him, he's the same person on the outside as he is on the inside. And so interestingly, we have two characters who both believe that looks aren't a big part of their personality, learning that looks don't matter, with the end result being a confrontation with the fact that their personalities really were to blame for everything that happens to them. The hangups with their looks were only a distraction from this fact. And Reagan too has a lesson about external hangups distracting her from real issues. She believes that her obsessions with work and the nature of her career are things that prevent her from finding real happiness with another person, only to, in the end, discover that once she gets to know another person, they also get to know her and realize the what has less to do with it than the why. The Breakfast Club The Brett Pack head to Still Valley, a town where everything is perpetually stuck in the 1980s, in order to drop off some chemtrails to keep the citizens brain dead enough to keep buying recalled products that can't be sold elsewhere. 
but the operation is at risk of being exposed when Mike falls from the plane, and so a rescue mission is formed to retrieve him from the 80s kids who found him without the use of modern technology. But Brett is continuously sabotaging the efforts as he wants to keep reliving his pop culture inundated childhood, taken to a logical extreme when he's exposed to the chemtrails directly and begins using 80s toys to wreak havoc. In the end, Reagan is able to calm him down, not by fighting nostalgia with nostalgia, but by bonding over their bad childhoods. Nostalgia is basically just a grass is greener mentality, but for time. The older you get, the more responsibilities you have, the more stress you have, and the more you long for a time when you personally didn't have that level of stress or responsibility. There was a point where the news had fear-mongered people into believing that the American way of life was so under attack that they thought that playing records backwards would summon demons. But for the current generation, television at the time was just a bunch of harmless toy commercials, and the news only very recently started fear-mongering. And nostalgia is also very selective in how it applies to our memories. We recall the best memories of growing up while conveniently forgetting to compare that to the best parts of today, or the inconveniences of the past. Watching video essays on YouTube is not something that would have been viable back in the days where you had to buffer the video for over an hour and hope it was something decent. And yet it's not as though nostalgia is something inherently bad, either. Reagan is shown to be miserable in this episode in part due to her lack of it. Being able to mutually remember the good old days and to have some sort of shared cultural childhood makes connecting to other people that much more possible. It's a magical experience to meet somebody, not really get along with them at first, and then to break the ice of that awkward moment by realizing that they, too, can quote any season 1 through 9 episode of The Simpsons. And so nostalgia is a perfectly cromulent way of forming human connections. Smartphones and the internet are powerful tools for making us closer together, and being embarrassed about your childhood interests can only stop you from using these tools to their fullest potential. And at the end of the episode, we learn that people who have spent the last several decades trapped in the 1980s don't quite find the happiness in their current decade, all wanting to go back to the 50s so they can live out their nostalgic fantasies. And of course, everybody is finding some role to play in Still Valley except Andre, which makes sense considering both his race and sexuality were things as frowned upon as they were misunderstood. My Big Flat Earth Wedding Reagan's mother, Tamiko, is getting remarried to herself, and Reagan is stuck with all of the planning, becoming neurotic as she tries to prevent things from going horribly wrong. Things such as her father Rand finding out and crashing the wedding with a bunch of flat earthers he's been leaking fake state secrets to. All of these plots convene on JR's yacht, which he's trying to sell to Jeff Bezos in order to offload the maintenance costs, which results in the flat earthers learning they've been lied to and going pirate. They hijack the boat and demand to see the edge of the world. In the end, Reagan brings their leader to the hollow earth cap and almost gets her parents back together, though that disaster is averted and Reagan learns to live for herself a bit more. Despite the conspiracy fantasy sync setting of Inside Job, there are still groups looked down upon by the narrative, namely actual conspiracy theorists. This is less out of disdain for the type of person who is essentially just creating fan theories for real life, and more so for the type of self-righteousness that comes as a result of believing you figured out something nobody else knows. And so all of this ends up begging the question of what precisely makes up a conspiracy theorist. At least, the neck-bearded archetype of one presented here. Because open-minded skepticism of anything you hear on the news or the internet isn't a bad thing by any means, but that's skepticism for the sake of knowledge and pursuit of the truth not skepticism for the sake of having some vague notion that your personality and ego are boosted by being a skeptic. Like a person playing devil's advocate because they want to point out potential flaws in a plan so it might be improved upon, versus a devil's advocate who simply likes to hear themselves speak. And so the show criticizes conspiracy theorists not for what they believe in, but rather why they believe in those things. The Flat Earthers are more concerned with some vague sense of self-righteousness about knowing things other people don't, rather than any actual goodness that can come as a result of having that knowledge. And of course, skepticism is fine, but you need to be skeptical of other skeptics as well. When evidence is shown to you that reinforces your beliefs, that evidence should be scrutinized more than anything else, since most conspiracies are formed by finding vulnerable and excluded people and telling them what they want to hear. If something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And so this is how Inside Job is able to easily write the line between good and bad faith implementations of its ideas. 
The subject matter of the show is adjacent to a lot of ideologies and have caused harm to a lot of vulnerable people, and so to reference these topics without condoning or dismissing them altogether is a balancing act that requires a firm resolve to show why it's on the side of politics that is doing the least harm without being so non-committal as to support a certain side through silence. Ghost Protocol Starting immediately after the previous episode, Reagan regrets hooking up with a Bond-esque stereotype, Rafe Masters, at her mother's wedding reception, as he's acting clingy and obsessive. But not wanting to be the bad guy of their relationship, she tries to downplay their involvement, and when this fails, simply fakes her own death. But when Masters decides to hunt down and avenge her killer, he ends up tracking her to a volcano fortress JR has been planning to buy, which also happens to be the former home of his old arch nemesis. Eventually, Reagan decides to stop avoiding the confrontation and simply tells Masters to his face that she's not that interested in him. While this is going on, Rhett begins to accompany his new spy friend on the mission, wanting the parental approval for Masters that he never got, but slowly becoming disillusioned with the guy's actual behavior. The biggest flaw of Rafe's personality is the fact that he's too old-fashioned for the modern era. He's a stereotype of the mid-late 20th century stud, and his behavior reflects the ideals of the time, and he hasn't quite moved beyond that. But just as the Breakfast Club deals with the unfortunate aging of nostalgia, this episode shows how a previously acceptable form of behavior can become creepy given enough time. Ultimately, Rafe's biggest flaw is less his personality, after all, he's merely reinforcing the type of behavior that has been rewarded for his whole career, but the fact that he's clinging to it as society marches on. It's like when people drag up old, casually homophobic remarks from a public figure and then act as though that's incriminating evidence of their bigotry. Were they homophobic then? Sure, but most people were. It matters how quickly they came around on their ideas. Were they leading the trend, or did they only begrudgingly accept others when it was no longer okay to let their real feelings on the matter come out? There are likely many socially acceptable ideas today that 20 years from now will be viewed as regressive and hurtful. Whether you're a good person has to do with how accepting you are of any flaws in your belief system when those are made apparent to you. So long as you maintain enough self-awareness about yourself and why you are the way you are, and you never let major aspects of your ego be defined by social pressures, you'll typically be safe from the inevitable progress of society. This is why old James Bond movies have aged poorly enough to the point where poking fun at them is acceptable despite their standing in pop culture, but something like Austin Powers still stands tall despite pulling from the same well. And yet, an attachment to the past and inability to accept a no can also have negative effects on others. Not just from the insistence on holding fast to outdated ideals, but the shame people can occasionally feel for doing the right thing. In this episode, Reagan feels conflicted on whether she should cut things off with Rafe, specifically because he embodies outdated stereotypes. If he's the type of person who can't take no for an answer, then people are less likely to want to tell him no in the first place. Reagan wants to do the mature thing right off the bat, but ends up having to go through a whole arc of self-discovery as a way to placate the feelings of a person she doesn't even care that deeply about. Buzzkill A moon colony turned sex cult that the US has declared a hostile nation has sent out a distress beacon and Reagan accepts the mission to travel there and investigate as a means of putting physical distance between herself and Rand. But rather than the crazed hippies they expected to find, the moon colony turns out to be a utopic paradise that simply needs help repairing its power grid. And what's more, when Rand stows away on the shuttle and travels to the moon with Reagan, she begins piecing together information from his story that might imply she's really the daughter of Buzz Aldrin so she investigates her potential biological father under the guise of assisting with the power grid repairs, and after finally feeling parental approval, decides to announce her theory to the astronaut. But it turns out he was trying to sleep with Reagan the whole time, and that he only wanted the power grid updated so he could have the moon deorbit the Earth. Back on Earth, the rest of Cognito tries to decommission the crisis actor who was playing Buzz when the real astronaut refused to return to Earth. The primary way by which Inside Job establishes its setting is through subverting existing popular conspiracies, doing so in such a way that the audience will be immediately familiar with the subject matter as it's merely drawing from common cultural knowledge, but not going so far as to officially condone any specific theory as true. And this is often achieved through absurdism, the idea that landing on the moon really happened but the return trip had to be faked, or that the Earth isn't flat but hollow, or JFK having sex with the Roswell alien, all cross the line of plausibility so thoroughly 
that bad faith viewers can't reasonably claim the show's content is potentially harmful. But back to the content, a major recurring theme of Inside Job is Reagan's fear that she's becoming her father, as though the desensitization of secretly controlling the free world will eventually turn her into the same type of detached sociopath that he's been for years. Or perhaps that, due to her bloodline, she's doomed to become him regardless of the life she leads. Because while she's managing to maintain her position within the company, Rand was expelled for butting heads with the masks. And of course, all of this is compounded by the fact that Rand seems to have been actively taking steps to force her to grow up to become like him, regardless of her actual wishes. Ironically, a character whose role is to control so many others is herself most concerned with the prospect of somebody else controlling her. And this ends up manifesting in a search for a different father. If her biological father isn't actually Rand, then this leaves one avenue clear for her independence from this life that's been pre-selected for her. That she isn't doomed to end up like Rand if she isn't related to him. The more biological distance she can create from her father figure, the more likely it is that her life is her own. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have Brett, somebody who is actively seeking out the parental affection that Reagan has rejected. Having not experienced a relationship with his own father, he's blissfully unaware of the potential toxicity of Rand and therefore actively seeks out to replace his lacking childhood something that the former Cognito member picks up on and actively exploits, a hint of his true nature that will be revealed more in the Part 1 finale. Mole Hunt JR finally gets his promotion to the Shadow Board, although he still has to compete in a gauntlet against other world leaders to obtain that position. He gives his old CEO role to Reagan, who declares her intentions to run the world in a much more positive and much less evil way. But when it's discovered that there's a mole within Cognito, Reagan has to violate more and more ethical rules in order to find out who it is. This culminates with the team turning on each other when dosed by Truth Serum before Rand is made into a suspect. In the end, Reagan struggles with whether to side with her work family or her real family and tries to exonerate her father before revealing who the true mole is, Barrow. Fundamentally, it's impossible for a person not to be influenced by their environment. People will be products of their time and location, regardless of whether they embrace culture or counterculture. I touched on this idea in the review for Ghost Protocol, and this episode takes a closer look at how this happens to a person from a first-person perspective, rather than looking in from the outside. Changes to the status quo have to happen steadily. We've already seen multiple times how a slight change can cause disastrous effects, and so enacting real, positive change is a process that needs to be done steadily over time. After all, any system that can quickly be overhauled into something new is just as easily a system that can be overhauled into something much, much worse. In the words of a great philosopher, The separation of powers acknowledges the petty ambitions of individuals. That is its strength. While fixing a broken system may not happen as quickly as we might want it to, breaking it further is also something that takes plenty of time, and as such, a single individual can never do a substantial amount of harm. But if things do suddenly get worse, it's not because of one ill-intentioned person getting put in charge, but rather, it's the people who thought to put him in charge that have to be blamed. As another great philosopher once said, a system organized around the weakest qualities of individuals will produce the same qualities in its leaders. And so it isn't just that a broken system will put a broken individual in charge, but that only a broken individual could ever be put in charge in the first place. This is ultimately the summation of Rand's scheme to ruin his daughter's psyche in order to have an in with Cognito. His plan, as outlined in the next episode, is ultimately a plan to create not the ideal employee for a broken organization, but an ideal leader, a second version of himself. So ultimately, the decision that Reagan has to make during this episode between her family and her work is actually a false choice, as both ends of the spectrum are identical by design. Her workplace may be a toxic one, but her family life is just the same. And yet, because of the latter, the former comes across as normal. Reagan has never known a healthy relationship, and the only reason she's able to do the right thing is because she's slowly coming around to the idea of what one might look like. Inside Reagan Barrow is threatening to destroy Cognito and everybody inside as their threats to Reagan's happiness, so she and Rand travel inside of Reagan's mind in order to unlock repressed memories of Barrow that might lead to the password to his override command. But while they're looking around her mind, Reagan keeps noticing glitches in her memories, and she eventually learns their origins, despite Rand's attempts to stop her, 
that her memories were altered by her father in order to ensure that he had an in with Incognito should he ever be fired, and that these memory wipes included deleting her only real friend, Orin, whose name happens to be the override password, something discovered by Brett when he accidentally stumbles into Reagan's mind and helps her with her self-confidence. In the end, a joint effort of the rest of the team is able to take down Barrow, including the help of a liberated Alpha Beta, and Reagan puts her father out of her life, choosing her career over her toxic attachments. Which lasts for all of a single night, as it's revealed that the Shadow Board has replaced Reagan with Rand as CEO. This episode best shows off everything about the first half of Inside Job that defines the show, for better and for worse. For better in that, despite the fantastic potential of the setting, the show still largely focuses on its characters, the tech and the world existing more as a vehicle through which we can see the characters react and then learn more about them as they adapt and change in response. And yet, this is done without downplaying the uniqueness of that setting. So we can see a grand set-piece battle between an indestructible emotional support animal and an AI president bent on destroying humanity and binge-watching friends, and yet the real climax of the episode is the point where Reagan finally stands up to her father, pushing him out of her life as she realizes the things that really matter to her. But then the B-plot shows off a few of the show's weaknesses in a pretty opaque way, namely that while the main characters are off exploring Reagan's memories, the rest stand about, talking about how important Reagan is and acknowledging that they're supporting characters to her story. It's fine for a show to focus largely on a single character, but at this point many of the side characters still seem to exist as repeatable one-off gags. It's not as though this is so much a weakness of the show's writing, but a limitation. We've only had 10 episodes and a lot has occurred in that time, so naturally not every character is going to get a chance to stand in the spotlight and get proper development. It's only because of how short the show has been up to this point that this comes across as natural, and of course, it's also an aspect of their characters that is understood, with jokes in earlier episodes lampshading this very phenomenon. Towards the end of this episode, there's a call to standardize given to Reagan when Rand offers to wipe both of their memories so they can go back to the way things used to be. Given that the rest of the cast has spent so much of the episode trying to return to their positions, it almost seems as if Reagan would jump at the opportunity to undo her mistakes as CEO so far. But this is a changed Reagan, somebody more willing to make hard sacrifices for the betterment of the world and those that she cares about. So she rejects the offer, and in the process, rejects the steady reshaping of her personality we saw in the position inflicted on her in the previous episode. Even if the victory was short-lived, it was still a victory. How Reagan Got Her Grove Back when Reagan tries to start a coup against her father, nobody supports her, as replacing one megalomaniacal boss with another doesn't really change their lives at all. Spurred on by missing the point at an anonymous anonymous meeting, she plots to sabotage him at Bohemian Grove, an annual festival between secret societies to party and compete for bragging rights. While there, she encounters Ron Statler, a former memory eraser for the Illuminati who is equally disillusioned with his job, and the two fight each other with their bosses fighting as proxy. But when their feud turns to romance, so too does the feud between their bosses, and the two eventually decide to keep dating in secret. Elsewhere at the Grove, Gigi is made fun of by the Illuminati, who taunt her for having her application rejected, and so she teams up with Andre and Brett to force them into ego death. Also, Glenn and Mike join the Juggalos, but quit when they realize how ridiculous the idea is. Ron and Reagan bond over their mutual disillusionment with their jobs, the type of people who wanted to get into shadow government work in order to make the world a better place, only to find that the stresses of associating with such a corrupt and amoral system were too much, and that their best efforts could barely change a thing. In the face of such overwhelming oppression, it's difficult to find the motivation to keep moving forward, and both characters ended up taking extreme measures to try to get some semblance of control from their lives, right up until the point that they met, bonded, and then fell in love. And of course, the love story between the two marks a shift in their respective attitudes towards their lives. While before they were at a breaking point in regards to the measures they were willing to go to for control, now they're happy with each other, and the stresses of an insane world don't seem like quite as much of a big deal. It's a bit like the love story from Orwell's 1984 in that it gives enough hope to the characters to become less accepting of the worst aspects of the world, and gives them more hope of things improving in the future something that often gets overlooked in interpretations of the novel in favor of government bad. Basically, whenever I hear somebody say, this is literally 1984, I usually just assume that they haven't read it. <laughs> 
This episode marks a return to form for the show as a whole after the finale to Season 1's Part 1. We get to see the more ego-driven antics of Rand during his stint as CEO of Cognito in comparison to the more financially motivated schemes JR enacted, and this also reflects a shift in the way the show tells its stories. In the first part, there was a necessity of establishing tone and setting that required the plots to bring in more outside influence, introducing other factions like the Reptoids, and showing the audience what a day in the life of a Shadow Government employee is like. This also lines up with the less character-driven plots that were necessary, as a result of the characters not having as much time to be introduced and developed. But now that the setting and characters are both in place, we get to see the latter group develop more, and so when Rand takes charge, the show shifts to more internal struggles than external. And so instead of stopping an AI from destroying the planet, we instead have plots about destroying a marriage or going to a reunion. And while the show feels more sitcom-y in its latter half as a result, it's able to be carried by strong character writing on top of the established world-building to create an end result that's so much more than the sum of its parts. Woes for Atu. Tomiko introduces her new boyfriend, Keanu Reeves, which makes Rand jealous enough to the point that he decides to create an action movie to prove how young he is. That and he orders Andre to create a youth serum that works too well. Reagan tries to be supportive of her mother's relationship, but soon learns that Keanu, as well as many other ageless A-list celebrities, all use the blood of young women to keep themselves from aging. She tries to sabotage the relationship and ends up exposing the entire charade to her mother, who then dumps Keanu for being too old for her. Meanwhile, Brent works his way up the pickup artist social hierarchy in order to get to Leonardo DiCaprio so he can recruit him into Rand's vanity project, though he ends up accidentally teaching them to respect women and also finds acceptance in his new posse. Subtext becomes text in this episode, something that's even lampshaded during its run. There's an obsession with youth as an end-all of aspiration. Tomiko only wants to date younger men, and Rand tries to make himself younger to be more appealing to her. DiCaprio leaves his posse behind in order to hang out with cooler and implied younger sycophants, and every other A-list celebrity does everything in their power to try and stay in touch with youth as much as possible. And all of this is put into direct contrast with the conceptual man-child, whether directly or indirectly. The desire never to grow older is attached with an unwillingness to mature beyond one's peak, which, combined with the message of peaking in the following episode, gives an overall message about people who refuse to grow up. Those who have given up on ever topping their greatest achievements in life, and instead of trying to improve, they try to go back to how things were. So many of Tomiko's actions in Inside Job are all about getting revenge against her ex-husband. Rather than seeking out happiness for herself, she seeks out misery for another. Or perhaps it's better to say that the two concepts are intertwined. Rand's attempt to take over Cognito ultimately has less to do with seeking out power, and more to do with trying to return to his own life. And so this episode posits that the obsession with staying young is tied to an obsession with the past, recapturing glory days, and trying to live off of nostalgia. It's equally fitting that the setting surrounds Hollywood, a city that has been trying to capitalize off of nostalgia and reboots for decades that seems to hate any reminder of the inevitable passage of time. Reagan spends this episode trying to have a more positive outlook on her mother's new relationship, giving it the benefit of the doubt and accepting that her mom has moved on. And yet despite her trying to do the right thing and accept the change, she ends up no better off due to the constant exposure to those around her who view change as a negative thing, a thing that pushes them further and further from their peaks. Reagan has recently found a new love and reinvigorated her passion for her work. Of course she'd be the one to have an optimistic view of the future. But that optimism is something that cannot exist when surrounded by regressive pessimism. So this episode thematically mirrors the decision that Reagan will have to make in the season's conclusion. Reagan and Michael's Hive School Reunion After Michael's attitude ruins a heist, he reveals to them that he's under pressure because his 5,000 year hive reunion is coming up and he's embarrassed to return as he was the loser of his hive, being the only one not to assimilate into the hive mind. But his friends agree to go to his reunion with him, posing as his human harem, so he can get a bit of confidence back and become an asset to the shadow government once again. 
but when he starts denigrating them once more, Reagan snaps and ruins the ruse, accidentally reuniting Mike with the hive in the process. The new Mike is much nicer, having mushroom personality spliced into his, but this turns out to be another ruse. The mushroom people were merely biding their time to destroy humanity and needed to read the minds of some surface dwellers to get the data they needed. So Cognito bands together to insult Mike to the point of breaking out of the hive mind so he can fire back, and the plan is foiled when Mike's toxic personality ends up reversing the assimilation, turning the underground into a cesspit too surly to be a threat to anybody but themselves. Meanwhile, an increasingly paranoid Rand tries to hunt down the person who's been defecating on his desk, discovering that it was JR all along, hiding in the walls of Cognito though the shadow board couldn't track him. An earlier complaint that I had with this show was the fact that many of the side characters were lacking in development, that they felt extremely one-note and existed largely for punchlines and interjections rather than any real contribution to the plot. But by this episode, it's clear that they've evolved so dramatically that those earlier complaints, more worries than anything, were graciously unfounded. Despite being the main character of the show, Reagan gets very little to do in this episode. In fact, you could make a few tweaks to who gets what lines and the entire episode could work without her. The fact that this is an episode primarily about Mike, with the rest of the cast tagging along, is made all the more clear when the larger threat is ultimately dismantled by him acting alone. The only contribution the rest of the team had was undoing something they themselves did. One thing worth pointing out about this show that I haven't seen get discussed much is the animation. It's something difficult to see in my style of editing, but in motion, this show stands out among many of its contemporary programs. It's something that I think actually ended up working against the show in the long run, since it ultimately got cancelled by Netflix for not making enough money. I'm not saying that it should have been phoned in and done in a cheap, Flash-esque, tweened way, but if you look at the movement in a show like BoJack Horseman, you can see how stiff animation isn't really that detrimental to a show that's primarily trying to appeal to people with strong writing, something that Inside Job has in spades. But back to that character writing, this episode gives us a resolution between JR and Rand as the latter's investigation leads to the discovery that the Shadow Board is continuing to track them both. They put their differences aside in order to deal with a bigger threat, and although JR ends up with the worst end of the deal, this largely serves to introduce further conflict that the duo can play off of, and to set up pieces for Project Reboot. Their mutualistic relationship is spurred on by their respective falls from grace, which themselves are spurred on when they realize that they can't have what they've always wanted. Money and power in JR's case, and domestic happiness in Rand, but I'll talk more about that when it comes up. We found love in a popeless place. Cognito needs to brainwash the Pope in order to make him less accepting and more likely to approve their animatronic hell project. Sensing the potential for a romantic vacation with Ron, Reagan volunteers and the two set out to ultra-Catholicize the Pope, which works too well when Reagan tries to speed up the process so she can spend more time with Ron. The Pope ends up burning down Rome, and Reagan has to put her insecurities aside in order to fix it. Meanwhile, the rest of Incognito goes on an Italy tour out of jealousy of Reagan's trip, only to wind up detained in the airport because Glenn refuses to acknowledge that the TSA is a real branch of the military. It's not until he sees their obsession with arbitrary rules and lauding power that he realizes and accepts that they truly are military material. Both Ron and Andre grew up in extremely religious households and slowly moved away from their former lives as they got older, just to different extents. While Andre was fast to move as far away as possible as fast as possible, Ron kept a lot of the guilt he built up over his childhood with him, enough that he was able to feel an extreme relapse when exposed to his own device. Andre, on the other hand, has had to over-medicate himself just to maintain a baseline level of function, something also indicative of the residual mental stress that an ideology of guilt and self-loathing can inflict onto a person, especially when the organization doing this knows fully well how strong a psychological grip can hold a person in place. But enough about the effects of bad faith religion on Psyche, I have another video on Moral Oral that covers the same ground as this section, so I'll just redirect to that instead of going on. The conflict of this episode is primarily caused by Reagan's impatience towards her relationship, wanting to focus on her romantic life instead of anything else. We've seen from the rest of the second half of the show why she would think this way. Her life was devoid of any meaning without her love life, 
Her work made very little tangible impact on the world, she wasn't respected for the contribution she could make, and everything she earned was just as quickly taken away from her. So it's easy to empathize with Reagan wanting to do more of the only good thing going for her at the moment. Even easier is the fact that it wasn't really Reagan's emotional failings that caused a literal hellscape to open up and swallow Rome. She's not the one to blame for the entire set of dominoes that had to be set up in order for the Catholicizer mission to have such a potential consequence in the first place. And despite how only one of her actions can be construed as creating a much larger mess, the narrative still posits that it's her responsibility to fix everything. The other plot of this episode is likewise one spurred on by a character wanting to show off the one good thing they have going for them. Glenn feels as though he's a complete failure in everything but his loyalty to his country, and so that's the aspect of his personality that he plays into the most. So when skipping airport security, he finally has a chance for his accolades to have a tangible benefit, only to then lose that when another person defined by their career feels threatened by his superiority. In the end, though, they're able to put aside their differences by bonding over the worst parts of what they value most, namely, having to put up with the circumstance and bureaucracy of the military, something which anybody who's ever had to put up with the VA can relate to. Brett Work Gigi gets Brett a job as a right-wing talk show host, which finally gives him the respect he's always wanted from his family. Up until he's ordered to run against his own brother for Senate, so Rand can have another deep state plant in the US government. Unable to be anything but a yes-man, he continuously agrees to everything, including Reagan's plan to sabotage his political career so he doesn't have to choose a side. But the scandals fail to make him any less popular, so they're forced to resort to a rehashed plan of faking Brett's death. But when Brett's fans declare that there's a conspiracy against the wrong group, they storm the Hand family's compound and Brett is forced to reveal the ruse in order to make things right again. Which involves a lot more puppetry than you'd expect. In the end, it's revealed that Rand had multiple plants running for public office and the entire thing was completely pointless all along. Brett's story arc through this episode closely mirrors that of Reagan during the finale of the first part of season 1, in that both characters craved, to an extent, the approval of and connection to their families, only to later conclude that that connection is meaningless if the other actor is not worth having the attention of. The Hand family doesn't care about Brett's well-being until it's personally profitable for them to do so, and even then, his happiness and success is still secondary to one of their own. If your happiness is something that can make another person happy and vice versa, then it's worth putting their emotions into consideration when deciding what's best for you. A person who doesn't actually care about your well-being shouldn't have the privilege of being able to decide it. We get a much closer look at the inner workings of Gigi's media control in this episode, specifically the fact that both of the sides she controls ultimately end up having the same message. New stations exist to sell ad space, like so much else in the information sphere, and based on testing, people who are experiencing strong emotions are more susceptible to propaganda and advertising. And one of the easiest emotions to artificially create is fear, especially when you can report on things so vague and poorly defined that it's impossible for a logical actor to properly respond. If a point is argued using a fallacy, then it becomes easier for a bad faith actor to defend it as they insist on only responding to counter arguments that bring up the same initial fallacy. It's like playing chess against a pigeon. It doesn't matter how good you are at chess, the pigeon will knock over all the pieces and strut around like it won no matter what. And ultimately all the attention of the media in this episode did very little to actually assuage anybody, perhaps by design. After all, telling people that things are going to be okay goes contradictory to the design of the media. They won't sell as much if their audience is in a good mood, and so rather than throwing an inconsistency into their programming by supporting a political power, they instead denounce the other side, scaring viewers once again into expecting a worst case scenario should anybody other than that day's sponsor get their way. Ron Tajan Reagan tries to introduce Ron to Cognito with the hopes of giving him a job there, and she uses Brett for his original purpose, a social lubricant so she doesn't have to navigate a potentially awkward situation. But when Ron's cynicism clashes with Brett's sincerity, Brett has to cope with the fact that he's finally met a person he wasn't able to immediately get along with. Or not, and he instead asked Andre to create a love drug but for friendships, 
This ends up working too well, and it spreads to the entire office, who start fighting with each other for Ron's attention. Brett, Reagan, and Ron have to work together to create a plan to fight off the infection, but the various brainstormed ideas are too off-putting for Ron, who already had his doubts about the Shadow World, and when they're finally able to reverse the effect, Ron leaves to think on their relationship. Meanwhile, Rand tries to impress Tomiko with a romantic date in the holodeck, but can't be bothered to show up himself, so he has Alpha Beta pose as him and woo Tomiko in his stead. But Alpha Beta ends up falling for Tomiko for real, and eventually the ruse is revealed, causing Rand to once again ruin things with his ex-wife. Despite her best efforts, Reagan isn't able to save Ron from his own doubts about the Shadow World. She and him both have fundamentally different views on whether things can change for the better, and whether they're the ones who will be able to enact that change. And while Reagan is slightly more optimistic, that optimism isn't shared, and Ron is put off by the back halls of Cognito, realizing that it isn't just the position that he holds which is holding him back from happiness, but that entire sector of the world. So while Reagan thinks that the solution is a simple change in scenery, Ron realizes that perhaps the grass is only greener on the other side because it's all astroturf. I guess I should point out that Rick and Morty did an extremely similar plot to this one. A virus designed to make a person like another person mutates and spreads to a now ravenous crowd who will stop at nothing to be near him. The key difference here being that one was done to another person without their consent, and the other was done to the consenting party. And while the outcome is the same, the tone that carries through the episode is what's different. Ron ends up being the one to put an end to the virus, but is also much more disturbed about what he's seen. Morty, on the other hand, is a much more passive observer in the situation, despite being the one who started it. And in the end, he's disturbed more by the implication behind Rick's fix for this situation. And then of course, both of these shows did it after the Venture Bros, but that's for a different time altogether. Another character that also has their last straw added during this episode is the plotline surrounding Rand and Tomiko. Rand wants to patch things up with his ex-wife, but doesn't actually want to go through the effort of romancing her, making Alpha Beta do it in his stead. Through this, we can see it's clear that he views his familial relationships as trophies more than anything else. Things that he wants to have purely because he's gotten everything else he's ever wanted out of life. No matter the money, or the influence, or the power he's accrued over the years, he can't force a person to love him. Ironically, this comes as the B-plot to an episode that contained an A-plot about that exact same thing. Project Reboot Mandela Effect type anomalies begin appearing in the universe and JR reveals the origin, a machine he created that can reboot timelines, creating slight variations on the existing reality, which happens to have been the machine that prompted the Shadow Board to give JR and Rand Cognito in the first place. They team up together to take out Rand, who they assume is jumping timelines to try to keep his job, only for Andre to get jumped out of phase when he takes his aluminum foil hat off. Reagan discovers that he's in a better place, as is the rest of the gang when they don't have Cognito holding them down, and they all mutiny to live better lives than what they have. In the end, Reagan encounters her father for a showdown, only to learn that he wasn't trying to save his job, but his family instead. He and JR are taken to Shadow Prison X, and Reagan is put back in charge of Cognito, with nothing to distract her from her collapsing relationship with Ron. The Mandela Effect is to me one of the funniest forms of collective delusion out there. The idea that a few people misremembered something in the same way and that's indicative of the fact that we've all jumped into an alternate dimension, rather than the human mind not really being great at remembering things. It's funny enough that people would err on the furthest side of Occam's razor that this phenomenon actually ended up getting a name. But in typical inside job fashion, it's a real thing that Cognito is involved in, and is implemented in a slightly different way than the typical interpretation is. A reality shift where the whole world was transported into a different dimension is not some government conspiracy, but just a guy's plan to get back with his ex-wife. But that's par for the course for inside job. Since the beginning of the show, the plots and anomalies have been more a result of individuals and their desires than any sort of force reacting in a logical way. This world is powered by psychology, not sociology. The wants of individuals can influence the world in a major way, rather than most incidents being a chain or reaction of systems with many people's input. In this way, the world of Inside Job is very different from ours, but that makes sense. Most people who believe in conspiracies do it so out of a sense that all of the ills of the world have simple causes. 
If the world is bad, it's because a few people are making it bad, not because of systems that have been implemented and evolved over thousands of years that the average person has little, if any, say in. To say that an individual or group is bad makes the solution to get rid of that individual or group. It's very easy to imagine. But to recognize the root of societal ills lies at a societal level puts a bit of the responsibility to change it on us, and nobody ever wants to change their way of life. Reagan's entire crew that abandons her ends up coming back after realizing that their new lives were only superficially better. While they had some of the things that they've always wanted, so much else that they had to deal with was worse off. But the messaging here ends up being less optimistic than it could have been. Glenn, for example, gets his human face back, something that he's happy about until he realizes that America also lost the Cold War, and so he'd have to be a loyal communist. There's a sense of irony in the fact that the country he's so loyal to is the one that demanded he mix himself with dolphin DNA in the first place, raising questions about whether that loyalty is well earned. Appleton Hoping to patch things up with Ron, Reagan goes to his house to find him packing for his future, with plans to move away from the shadow government lifestyle and to live instead in a quiet town away from everything. His memory's wiped, so nobody comes after him. He invites Reagan to join him, but she's unsure, made worse when the shadow board offers her a position as partner, since her attachment to Rand was the only thing holding her back and he's no longer a factor. Torn between what's best for Ron and what's best for the world, she eventually chooses both, wiping Ron's memories but staying behind to secretly run the world while he gets to move on. Meanwhile, Brett leads Cognito in Reagan's absence to remove all of the plot holes from the last season, all of which were caused by Project Reboot and not bad writing. But when the final Mandela effect happens to be a dog who can play basketball that threatens to evolve into the Earth's new dominant species, Brett realizes that he doesn't have the leadership to kill the Golden Retriever, but he does have the leadership to rewrite the rulebook to say that a dog can't play basketball. Brett was originally brought on to the Cognito team as co-leader, meant to serve a supporting role to Reagan, but ultimately it was the intention from the beginning that he run things. But this never properly came to fruition, and his role was quickly dedicated as the stock outsider trope, meant to serve as an audience surrogate to ask questions about the world that wouldn't make sense for any of the experts in their field to not understand. This episode sees Brett making a return to his original intention as a character, and also shows how decidedly he fails in this proper role, unable to do any of what's required him as a leader. But in the end, he manages to circumvent the original issue he had, that being his inability to kill a dog, by doing a bit of creative thinking to avoid making a more decisive action. Through the first half of the show, we saw that Reagan was, from the beginning, Rand's backup plan in order to have a plant within Incognito should something happen to him. His method of ensuring that she'd get into his position was by making Reagan as much like him as possible, but here, we see that his original plan failed. While Reagan was similar enough to get into Cognito and work her way up, she ultimately remained too emotionally damaged by that upbringing to be as much of an asset, with her promotion taking until she had already experienced burnout. It's this very same emotional hang-up that the Shadow Board recognizes as a limiting factor, holding her back from greatness. The thing that is simultaneously elevating her intellect to the point of being Rand's equal, while also preventing her from rising above him. But in the end, Reagan does manage to one-up her father when she ultimately does the one thing he could never do, let go of her attachments for the greater good. Rand has been psychopathically pursuing his goals in life, tearing down anybody who gets in his way, and yet in the end, he never quite manages to find out what he really wants. In the end, he retrieves Project Reboot from where it was buried and betrays the Shadow Board, doing the thing that he promised not to in exchange for his original position. Rand was willing to throw away decades of work for a second chance and a relationship that he himself ruined. But Reagan was mature enough to understand that she can't have it all. She makes the hard decision that her father never could, and allows Ron to go on living without her in the interests of making the world a better place. Outro I stated at the beginning of this video that Inside Job was an instant classic, the type of show that, upon a first viewing, a savvy audience member can immediately recognize as something much greater than it may have initially been sold as, and what's better, something with even more potential to improve than what might be immediately apparent. But it was also a show that was severely misunderstood from its inception.
At the time, the adult animation landscape, it was existing in the shadow of the massive cultural icon that was Rick and Morty. Every studio executive was looking for the next big thing, and they were exclusively looking to the past for that. And so you can see why Inside Job appealed to them. A show with the main character who's a super genius scientist navigating a setting that uses some real-world elements while borrowing extremely thoroughly from pop culture ideas to build on. And while this description applies to Inside Job, I hope that this video is proof enough that this show is so much more than that. Because while past obsessed executives might have ultimately cancelled Inside Job for not being the immediate cultural runaway that Rick and Morty managed to be, I feel as though it was a big mistake not to recognize what it was becoming. It had a slow start to be sure, much of the cast was one-dimensional, and the resulting plots involving them came across as shallow as a result. But as it went on and the cast grew into much more developed of an ensemble, the show, too, evolved into something with enough potential to rival television mainstays like Futurama, Bojack Horseman, and of course, the obvious comparison to Gravity Falls. Inside Job was a show that had to exist under the pressure of being something that it wasn't, and was ultimately cancelled for not living up to that arbitrary standard. And that's the greatest tragedy of this whole story. Just when it was starting to get really good, it was taken away from us. And so, its possible future has ended up like all the other myriad single-season cult shows that executives took away from us all too soon. But if there's one thing I've learned from the past few months of making these videos, it's that stories like this never end. Just like Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein of the short-lived Mission Hill went on to write for the Golden Age seasons of The Simpsons, I have no doubt that many of the extremely talented people attached to this project will continue to do wonderful things in their careers. Still, it's just a shame it couldn't have been more inside job.